working. Okay, hello. This is the October 9th, 2024 meeting of the Amherst Energy and Climate Action Committee, which was organized to guide the town in meeting its climate mitigation and resilience goals. Those goals and the plan for getting there are adopted from the Climate Action Adaptation and Resilience Plan, or the CARP, which was accepted by the town council in 2021. With 2016 as its base year, CARP calls for a 25% reduction in carbon emissions by 2025, 50% by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2050. So this committee has two primary functions. One is to advise the town council uh, and recommend or propose policies or actions that'll help us meet the climate goals. And the other is to promote a just, equitable and speedy climate response through outreach and engagement of town and local stakeholders. With that, we will start our agenda for today. The first item of which is always not on the agenda because it's to find who is going to be our note taker for this week. Um, so I'm trying to get the... Steve did it last time. Steve did it last time. Laura's not here. Michael, do you want to take notes? Uh, sure, I can take notes. Thank you. Um, I will have, I, I am... Oh, you have to leave early. I'm going to be leaving early. I don't so know why how... Don't we... That you works. could just announce and um, I can continue from that point on or somebody okay. else can take over or two okay. of us can do it just to okay. make sure. All right, Michael, just just take, yeah, just take notes until you, until you leave. That sounds good. Okay. Um, so the next thing to do is to review the minutes from last week, which I can share right here and to approve the minutes after having a look at them. So let me make it a little bigger, this bigger, and then view bigger. Okay, here's our minutes. Um, was Laura here or not last week? No, that's why it's mm -hmm. blank. Oh, is that present or not present? Okay, never mind. I thought it was right, blank. <laughs> um, okay. minutes. Steve was our note taker and Steve was always very concise and simple. Uh, we will talk about the waste hauler thing tonight. Nothing new on a lot of the updates. Advisory and support for a few things. <laughs> Um, let's see. Anyone have any changes or comments? Anything? I just have a correction of my name under nine, but that's, I'll, I'll take care um, of that. This is Stephanie instead of? No, it's Chicarella, but there's an R. Oh, right. Oops. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> it's easy to add other letters in my name. <laughs> It's interesting. My, my, you can see that the spell checker actually got it. Yeah, you got it right. <laughs> yeah. How did it know? <laughs> Terrifying. And that's it. Do we have a move to accept the minutes? I see Caitlin nodding. Can you, we just need it to be, um, we just need to say it. You can uh, say so moved. Yeah. Uh, moved. Yes. So we have a second. A second. All right. Now I got to stop sharing. Okay. And in no particular order, um, I just need your vote, yes or no, uh, to approve the minutes. Goldner? Yes. Davis? Yes. Roof? Yes. Issing? Yes. Lining? Yes. I. Allison? Yes. Minutes are approved. Okay, next thing on the agenda is always public comment. We have one member of the public uh, here. If that member of the public would like to make, oh, I see a raised hand. Stephanie. Yep, just give me one second. Okay. Hey. Oh, hello, Councillor Ette. Let me allow you to speak. Go ahead. Can you speak? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I am Councillor Etty, and I'm the liaison for 
uh, ECAC, which I diligently listen to, but I believe this is my first time speaking at the meeting. So I just wanted to introduce myself and make sure that you're aware that I am keeping up with your meetings. Great, thank you very much. I'm going to mispronounce your name. Can you tell us again how to pronounce it? Freka. Freka? Yeah. Okay, Freka, thank you very, very much. Very much appreciated that you're here. Um, there is a lot. Uh, did you have any other comments for us? So I am usually at this weird time and I'm actually in the office right now and I will soon be going home. So it's very difficult for me to ever make the meetings, um, but I'll be on for about 10 minutes before heading home. And I just wanted to know if there's anything that I could assist with. Um, interesting. So we're we actually are going to be discussing a lot tonight, including the town, uh, the annual report and the recommendations of ECAC for town manager goals for next year. Um, so um, this the first thing on the agenda, I don't know how far we'll get, maybe we should just do that. I think that's probably the most important discussion for you to be a part of this evening, that and maybe the, um, and, and yes, and also the solar bylaw discussion. So maybe we can move that up. Where did that go on the list? Oh, it's probably under, under um, advisory and support. Correct. Um, so we might move that up if you're still here, because uh, I think I think that's something that would be important for you to hear too. Do, do, do folks agree? Yeah, yeah I agree. that sounds good. Should we start with annual report or with solar bylaw? Any thoughts? I would start with annual report, Laurie. Okay. All right. In that case, let me share the annual report document, uh, which is here. Um, Okay, so let me make it a little bit bigger. If I can find the, oh, view. No, no, that's not what I wanted. Um, Zoom, there we go. No, yeah, that's not what I wanted either. Let me just do this. There, I hope that's large enough to see now. Um, I had a few questions. I think that the beginning, I changed a little bit around the beginning. Um, that I think were around some of the comments that were made a couple of weeks ago, that the town is making progress in addressing climate goals, but significant barriers remain. Transition to green infrastructure, transitioning buildings away from fossil fuels has been slow. But progress is now visible on proposed changes to the Jones Library and the start of construction on the net zero school. Um, I didn't quite, Stephanie, you and I can discuss this offline, but I didn't understand uh, the response to this question about whether or not any multi-unit apartment buildings have been transitioned to heat pumps. Uh, because the answer seemed to indicate that some were, but there were no retrofits. And I don't know what that meant because the, the ones Lori, that were- Laurie, meant new construction had heat pumps. It meant that there were no retrofits of existing complexes. Okay, because the the addresses he gave, I didn't think were new construction. So or maybe they were new old construction or something. Well, they might have been additions to yeah. existing complexes, uh, but okay. All right. That's what he was referring to. Okay. So there haven't been any any retrofits. And I'll fix that up and correct. You know, okay. I'll, I'll send it in. Um okay. so what we did here was we went through all of the different um there there are five things we report we're required to report on. We went through each of the five of them and added stuff that has been going on in the last year. Um, and then I went through with Stephanie, the specific goals mentioned, the specific strategic goals mentioned in the CARP and basically put something next to each of them as to where they are uh, in the program. And then, and I don't think we need to go through those again, uh, unless people wanna look at it and make some comments. I think that's all done. I think the only thing we really need to discuss is the town manager goals at the bottom. Um, and one of the things on it, I think we need to wait on because it's in regards to zero waste, the waste hauler proposal that we'll talk about later. Um, so I think 
this we'll talk about later. So I won't, you know, consider that still tentative, but I think the rest of these we're okay with. The seventh one hasn't changed much since last year, I think. Um, do we want to talk about this one last time? So, um, so Freca, the things that we're asking for are that the, you know, the town, that first of all, everything, there's so much to be done and, and not enough support for it. Um, so it would be great to, you know, get some help <laughs> for Stephanie. That's one thing we've been asking for year after year. Um, and that would obviously, we're supposed to talk about budget here according to our charge, but I don't know that that's really something we should be doing. Um, I do think that it's worth supporting another position in the sustainability department. Um, in regards to building energy, these are all things addressed in the CARP. Um, we hope that the town manager will use us more as a resource to help promote PACE. That We haven't had PACE as a uh, Massachusetts program to encourage what small businesses and multi-unit landlords to transition their homes, to retrofit their, their businesses um, and apartment complexes to clean energy and to heat pumps. And um, there hasn't been much use of it uh, anywhere and none at all in Amherst. So we'd really like to see something happen on that front. And we hope that the new heat pump program that just went into place will help with that. Um, but we're here and you know if there's some help that the town needs on that to get that going, uh, we'd love to hear about it. Um, same thing with the draft solar bylaw that's being talked about right now. The ECAC, I think we're gonna discuss it today, I believe we will find that we have some concerns about it. Um, I hope that the town manager will draw on our expertise. Um, in regards to transportation infrastructure, we are short a transportation plan in this town. And as I mentioned every week, I, you know, I no longer feel safe taking my bike out of my neighborhood. I usually put it on the car to get it out of the neighborhood at this point. And I ride with a giant pool noodle sticking out the side so I don't get killed. Um, there are roads with no shoulders or with shoulders that have been destroyed by patches on top of patches, pothole patches. The pothole patching machine is a disaster for bicycling. Um, and it's made the roads much worse. Um, I'd rather have a pothole in the middle of the road than a patch that goes into the, into the, into the, into the margin um, that leaves rubble there and makes it unusable. Um, so we need, a, we need a plan, a transportation plan that really needs to happen. Um, with regional issues, we're asking that the town manager find ways uh, to get more people to convert to Valley Green Energy. Um, folks like me, for example, who were on, I just, I just opted in, but who were on a different energy provider than Eversource, uh, we, had, we didn't get anything in the mail. <laughs> you know, we have very little way of knowing about the transition um, and there should be ways to encourage people to reach out to those people who are not using Eversource. Um, there's a zero waste, there's a, there's a waste hauler proposal that we're going to discuss today that I believe brings us closer to zero waste goals discussed in the CARP. And finally, we ask that, I think this is something that the town has been doing in the last few years, and we really want to see it continue, that uh, every decision the town makes needs to be made with a climate justice lens, right? Um, it, it's just so important. Uh, it's I, you know, interviewees should be asked questions uh, about, about, you know, their contribution to green culture, their contribution to a, a just energy transition. Um, and in particular, Stephanie should continue to be asked to uh, review and contribute interview questions um, for pretty much every new position, I think, and for every decision that's, for every decision that's made, there should be some climate lens um, applied. So that's our, our, our asks. <laughs> um, anyone else have anything to add? I, I've been talking a lot. I don't... Or does this sound okay? Should we stick with this? Is this too much? Early on, we thought we should find one or two more concrete things to ask for. In my mind, I, I feel like this is this is okay. I don't, I don't, it's seven items, but they all, I mean, 
each one doesn't seem to be asking for the world. Yeah, some of them are bigger <laughs> houses than others. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I agree. I think the overall, the whole annual report, <clears throat> it's a little on the long side, but I think it's it's good enough, and we should probably wrap it up and send it over to the council. Okay. The only thing I want to finish discussing is the zero waste. Make sure we want to keep that in there. Because we haven't really talked about that yet. Okay. In that case... Yep. Shall we wrap this up and move on? I don't think we need a vote on this because this is just supposed to be, I think the chair's report to the council. Um, I don't think we need a vote, do we, Stephanie? You don't have to have one. Um, I my, I think as long as everyone is good with your summary, yeah. then I think you're good to go. All right. Well, if you have any other comments, I'll send this in this week, probably early next week, actually, at this point, because I'm leaving town tomorrow morning. Um, but I'll, I'll clean it up and send it in um, early next week unless I hear from folks. Okay. Treka, any any questions? Um, not particularly. I The report is going to be sent to the council. Yeah. I don't know if anyone is going to be presenting the report. Yeah, I presented last year and I wouldn't mind doing it again. Um, I understand that there's that it's not easy to get a slot on the council agenda, but if I could have 10 minutes, I would take it, <laughs> even five minutes, just to go over the, the requests. Okay, then in, in that case, I would um, recommend that you make the requests and see what comes of it. And mm -hmm. in the events that that's not possible, then I might be able to make a summary during the liaison report. Okay, all right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, there have been a lot of really exciting things this year, so it would be nice to go ahead, Stephanie. I was um, just going to say that I, I would recommend that we do what we did last year was you submit the report to the town manager and okay. the president of the council mm -hmm. with your request. And um, then you will, I think, be informed whether or not your request will be granted. And if it isn't, then we can certainly, um, I'd be happy to um, contact Councillor Ette and um, ask that it be covered in, in the uh, liaison report. Okay, great. Thank you, Stephanie. You're welcome. Okay, in that case, uh, let's move on. Let's see what's next. Um, waste related. Uh, waste toilet. Oh, wait, we're going to do solar bylaw next because I think that's we're going to move solar bylaw up because I think that is the most important thing for the counselor to hear. Um, so, Steve, why don't we start with you on that? Thank you very much for sending that summary. Okay. Thank, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll just start with that summary. I think sort of the main background to understand, and, and Andrew and Caitlin, I'm not sure what your background is, but uh, I tried to lay out this background for Massachusetts that solar energy systems have sort of a privilege in state law that they shall not be prohibited or unreasonably regulated. And that is um, joins the class of things that include schools and houses of worship and some other telecommunication infrastructure, things that, I, as I understand it, in the past have sometimes faced opposition in the local communities whereas the broader community sort of accepts them as necessary and valuable. Um, this law, I'm not sure it's been on the books for decades. Um, it has taken up sort of more importance, prominence as the Massachusetts decarbonization, decarbonization plan has sort of laid out the amount of solar energy that we need from photovoltaics is greater than what can be possibly put on rooftops and is going to need to occupy some land. Um, that goal kind of comes into conflict. Um, however, this particular section of the law, chapter 40A, section three, is really what has sort of helped pave the way or allowed some of these um, ground mount solar developments to occur despite local opposition. Mm -hmm. So the town has heard um, of, of starting several years ago, concern about some 
often particular solar developments. They may be happening in Amherst or sometimes they're nearby and residents are uh, concerned and or opposed. Um, we went through a period where there was an attempt to get a temporary restriction on all solar development um, to allow a more permanent bylaw to be developed. The town council considered that, it was a good debate, and turned down a temporary um, restriction on all solar development, but did endorse and move forward on developing a bylaw. So the bylaw has been under development for a couple of years. Uh, there was a solar bylaw working group that worked on it, and that included one of our representatives, um, Dwayne Brager, who was very well qualified for that role. Uh, he's a been working with the state on uh, um, energy related issues. He's part of the uh, UMass Clean Energy Extension. Um, so he's quite familiar with that. So he was our representative to the committee. He was elected chair of that solar bylaw working group. So he had the, the privilege and fun of shepherding that through. There were reps from the town planning board, um, several boards, and then a handful of um, citizens that were uh, collected from the town. They put together the bylaw, uh, finished it up last fall. I think it was November or so of 2023. Um, now I see a typo there that, no, that's, so that then that was transmitted from the solar bylaw working group to the town council. Town council then said, yes, thank you. And they gave it to their subcommittee, the community resource committee or CRC for review and um, continued work. CRC has been working on it now. Since then, there's been a change in the makeup and leadership of the CRC because there are elections that happened last year. There's a little bit of a delay there, but they're back there and they're, they're working on it. And their main goal is to take what Solar Bylaw Working Group put together and make sure it's a sort of a viable bylaw. The Solar Bylaw Working Group, um, the direct members, didn't have a lot of experience with writing bylaws. Stephanie and a town planner, Christine Brestrip, were helping um, and advising, uh, but CRC is now working to sort of reduce the redundancies and try to make the language a little bit more typical of a bylaw. So that's a bit of the background. Um, I guess I'll, let me pause and see if there are questions at this stage, broader overall questions about the solar bylaw for many members here of ECAC. Okay, I'll keep talking, but I'll um, certainly entertain questions as they come up. I may or may not see a hand get raised, so some, you know, somebody can just speak up or alert me if a hand goes up. Bylaws are the way of re limiting something. These are zoning bylaws, um, and so typically zoning bylaws are to limit something. And, and so by nature, the solar bylaw is limiting solar development with the goal of promoting health, safety, and public welfare. That's the criteria in that state law that I mentioned a moment ago that um, you, towns and cities cannot prohibit solar energy systems except to, in the case of health, safety, and general public welfare. So the bylaw is working to justify any restrictions on ground mount solar development in the name of health, public health, safety, and uh, welfare. Um, the bylaw is only uh, looking at larger ground mount systems of 250 kilowatts uh, or larger. That's about an acre or larger in size. So it does not apply to rooftop systems, does not apply to parking lot canopies, and it does not apply to smaller ground mount systems that um, someone may want to build you know, in their backyard. Or I know, I think uh, Atkins Market in South Amherst has a small ground mount system next to their shop that would not fall under this um, proposed bylaw. Um, so this has been going on it's, and, and uh, CRC has been working on this for months, seems like maybe almost forever. Um, and eventually CRC will, be satisfied with it and it will come back to town council. Um, my, I guess I'm, I'm a bit conflicted. I'm not quite sure to know what to think about this, um, this bylaw. Unfortunately, the nature of bylaws, they are designed to restrict something. And it's really hard to make a town bylaw that 
promotes something. I would love to see the town promote solar development, ground mount solar development in the most appropriate places, not the pristine forests, not the old growths or uh, the most valuable ecosystems, but to find a way to identify those lands that are suitable for solar development and try to point or encourage somehow solar development in those areas. Now that's, that's really hard to do. The town doesn't have a lot of resources for promoting solar development. And you can't make laws that say thou shalt develop solar on this parcel of land because we think it's good for solar. You can't do that. The town could restrict what the landowner can do, but they can't tell the landowner what to do. Um, so um, the CRC has continued to work on this. So shifting gears just slightly here in my notes and summary that I sent to you last week, they're already outdated. Um, the opening parts of the bylaw have been changed. And so some of my comments and things that bothered me about the, the nexus statements at the beginning, statements that were there to try to justify the restriction of solar developments, those have already been changed. And I think they're, they're quite a bit better. Um, and if I can, am I allowed, may I share my screen and show that most recent version? Please, please do, or I can. And while you're doing that, Michael has his hand up. Great. Michael, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Out so I, mine was more, my question is kind of like a, a similar background question of like, and I think we've probably discussed this and I may have just forgotten, but like in terms of how unique this bylaw is how many other towns mm. in massachusetts are well maybe one have passed something of this sort or two considering it like how you know how unique is amherst the amherst town itself in this in this situation versus like when we look at the state of massachusetts or towns around us do you know? Stephanie, can, can you answer that because i know the committee the solar bylaw working group not a committee a working group looked at multiple town bylaws from neighboring towns. So many neighboring towns have them. Uh, many towns across Massachusetts has. I don't know if it's 50% okay. or 70%. Do you know, Stephanie? Oh, I don't know. I don't think it's nearly that many, though. I think uh, very few actually have um, solar uh, solar bylaws. Um, but there are some that have been developed. Uh, there are some that have been challenged by the state because yeah. the language mm -hmm. was too restrictive. So um, there have been, and those are some that are actually in neighboring communities. So um, I would say, I think there was, and this is just off the top of my head and I don't remember if it's accurate or not, but I wanna say roughly 13, or at least we maybe used mm -hmm. 13 to reference in developing our draft. But again, ours went through a process where the director, the then director of planning, Christine Brestrup, basically put a draft together and then the solar bylaw working group just went section by section and made edits as they went along. And um, we had many experts come in. And uh, so there was quite an involved process in developing it. But mm -hmm. I would say that it doesn't mean that the doc the document that we ended with as a draft really needed a lot of work because it really... Uh, in and of itself, it, it 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 was problematic because there were things that just simply aren't enforceable in it. So that's why the CRC is going through their process of how to make this something that can actually be implemented. The mm -hmm. draft bylaw was also informed by the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, which is a regional Western Mass Planning Commission. They had put out I think at least 10 or 15 years ago, a sort of a model um, solar bylaw. So many of the sections were taken from that. I think um, the submittal sections um, were taken from that. I think there was also a state agency that had put together um, sort of a model solar bylaw. Um, mm -hmm. So those were used, those, those examples were used as well as um, bylaws that have been passed in other towns. And I know the Solar Bylaw Working Group considered some of the court challenges that have happened to town bylaws and right. was aware that, oh, wait, we can't do that because that sort of thing has been struck down in a neighboring town. So it's, a, it's kind of a delicate balance here to create something that is justifiable 
to protect the public welfare, uh, health, safety, public welfare, without being overly restrictive. And the court rulings haven't been all that helpful. They One ruling was like, okay, a town could not restrict solar development to less than, I think it was 2% of the town area. They said that was too restrictive. But of course they didn't say, would would 5% be okay or 7%? Right. <laughs> uh, so the towns kind of have to guess, you know, how much can they do and will it withstand scrutiny um, during challenges? Um, towns that are town governments, they will automatically, any bylaw gets automatically reviewed by the attorney general's office. And several towns have had theirs challenged or actually um, overturned, I believe, by the attorney, the, the office of the attorney general that reviews town bylaws. Amherst is a city. It's the city known as the town of Amherst, but we're a city government. So technically, I believe our bylaws that are passed by the Amherst being being officially a city government doesn't immediately have direct review by the attorney general's office, but it could get challenged by lawsuits and therefore go to court. Um, okay. The I'm, I think I'm sharing, if you can see my screen, there's the latest mm -hmm. versions um, with a bunch of cross out and red lines, but the next, well, the, the opening statement here, I think has gotten better balanced. Um, and it describes the overall purpose is it, it describes the need for increasing renewable energy generation while protecting health, safety, general public welfare by restricting or developing standards for the placement, design, construction, operation, monitoring, modification, and decommissioning of large scale ground mounted photovoltaic systems or LGPIs um, and battery energy storage systems or BESS is. That Steve, I think is, I don't, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah. So uh, Steve, going, you had some pretty serious concerns about the nexus statements that I agreed with. Yeah. And I'm wondering how that's changed because those were, if, if those still remain, I think we need to write a letter to the CRC. Well, that's, I, I guess that's what we can discuss here. And so this is the revised nexus statement. And I'm, I'm not quite sure. I guess it'll still be called the nexus statement 17.02. Um, it refers to, originally it was forest lands and then it was agricultural lands, but now the proposed heading is carbon sequestration. This paragraph that I think you can see is about the importance of carbon sequestration. My concern is that it, it, if you read this, you might think that the Massachusetts Climate Action Goals are all about climate sequestration, I'm uh, sorry, carbon sequestration. And that if we just simply saved our forests, then that would be it, would be done, would, would be our climate action would be solved here. But that's certainly not the case. The, the major aspect of Massachusetts decarbonization plan is, is stopping the burning of fossil fuels and replacing that with renewable energy. Yeah, and Steve, it, it, it's worse than that, right? Because, and, and this is something I, I, I can't, I want to say it again and again, um, our forests, we don't have very many forests that aren't logged on a regular 60-year cycle. And that 60-year cycle, if you ask the local foresters, that's exactly where they believe and they have evidence for the forest becoming really good carbon sinks. So right at the point where they're becoming really good carbon sinks, we've been tearing them down anyway. And 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 the bad way. I mean, we do clear cutting in a terrible way, right? It's not as bad as out west when nothing ever regrows, but it's not like they're pulling a tree out here and there. They're going in with giant equipment, mashing up the soil, destroying the undergrowth. You know, there, there are thoughts that the, the understory, which is really where the carbon gets stored, takes takes hundreds of years to really regrow correctly, or as it, you know, as it as if it were a really fully functioning forest. So it's 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 a bit, you know, and right now we know from the from the great work that Dwayne and the and the extension did, and you know, with with the with the uh, with the solar forum, right, the Western Mass Solar Forum, that right now the win is to put in solar. Later, the win will be to not disturb the forests, but right now the win is to put in solar, and and that does more for you in terms of carbon you know, not sequestration, but not putting carbon into the air and for carbon, carbon, in, in terms of the carbon budget, that is the better thing to do now. And this is misrepresented in these nexus statements. 
people are trying their hardest to justify why they don't want the forest taken out in terms of things that are not really true or that are not, that may be true, but that we're doing anyway, regardless of solar. You know, if whether there's solar or not, those trees are going to get mowed down. <laughs> you know, and well, and that's something we can address. But it bugs me that a solar bylaw is restricting the one thing that actually could make a positive difference. I, I don't know if this makes sense. I, it it just it it's it it doesn't it seems specious to me to talk about it in this way. I really, you said it best in the little note that you wrote that they're, that it's misrepresenting the facts. And what is it even doing in here? <laughs> it, I, I have to say it's better now than the version that I summarized and sent out in that summary even late last week. I, okay. I hadn't seen the most recent version. So I, I'm a bit happier with the most recent version. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I agree that carbon sequestration is the sort of the weakest reason for preserving forests because honestly if you cut down a forest and put a solar field up it's a huge benefit carbon wise to the atmosphere because of the fossil fuels that you don't have to burn because you now have solar there it's a it's a 10 factor maybe 20 or 30 factor better yeah. but of course we don't want to cut down all of our forests and the misconception might be too that we aren't we don't have to the amount of solar that we need to put on the ground is maybe 2% of Massachusetts land area. And at least 25, maybe 30% of Massachusetts forests are permanently protected as either parks or, or, um, or under forest protections. So we have a lot of forest land protected. And we're talking about the need for what I think is a very small percentage of land forest and otherwise that we need to put into solar development to meet our climate goals. Stephanie has a question. Go ahead. Um, not so much a question as a, a comment, um, just to sort of talk about this section just a little bit is that I think it's still, I mean, I definitely think there's still work um, I don't think it's anywhere near being decided upon where this is going to be or the language of this. So I just um, didn't want you to get too concerned quite yet. <laughs> so um, there's that. And then also, I would say that um, in the bylaw, you, um, and I know this sort of nexus statement talks kind of generally, but I think um, it, it does also want to point to those things that can be regulated, if you will. So, you know, you're going to identify very specific areas that you're protecting or things that you are, activities that you're regulating and then specific things that you're protecting. So um, burning of fossil fuels isn't going to be something you're going to be able to regulate in a solar bylaw, right? But carbon sequestration is something that you can address. So I think those are the things that would be touched on. So I just want to Put that just sort of put that out there as a perspective. I'm not saying that any of what you said. I'm not disagreeing with any of you what you said. I'm just more explaining, um, you know, why some of this language is in here in the way that it is. Andrew, yeah, um, building on um, Steve's point about you know, solar is 10, 20 times better than you know, one tree, like, you know, on, on terms of impact, ha, is there a sense of timing in here? Because I think the state has a goal of, I think, 2030, or maybe a much nearer term goal. And like a forest, like you said, grows in 60 years. And so like, it's much more important to have to achieve our near term goals, than like maybe some long term balancing of like, yes, a forest sequesters this much carbon and solar prevents this much carbon we need the prevention now yeah. and preserving forests or growing new forests isn't going to help our goals yeah. one of the points just to answer that before we get to you don one of the points that was made in the solar forum is that putting in solar now is the important thing because yeah. right now the grid is only half green and so putting in solar now you know even if you're displacing some trees does more good than it's going to do 10 years down the line when things oh, when this when the grid is greener, right? 10 years down the line, the formula changes because putting in a solar array won't change the electric grid that much, 
Right now, putting it in changes it a lot. It's a win. So this will change over time. It will impact the forest, but not, you know, 2% of land is what they're talking about, right? And, and you have to consider that, that 100 years ago, this state wouldn't have had any forest, right? Or 150 years ago. So it, it's not, yeah, anyway, I'll leave it at that. Don, you had, you had a question. Uh, um, I have actually two comments, Steve. I mean, I, I, I do like the change in the language that makes it in the nexus statement that makes it sound like some sort of balancing test. Yeah. Um, but what I don't see is that what you're really balancing is the benefit to the health, safety, and welfare of the town from solar development <laughs> versus the benefit <laughs> Because implied through all this is somehow or other, you know, it just says our need for increasing renewable energy. But that is a benefit to the health, safety, and welfare of our community, um, developing solar energy. And, and, and by just sticking that in there the way they stuck it in there, you really got to think about the fact that bringing solar is a benefit to our health, safety, and welfare. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's the real balancing test. And the second thing, as we look at what areas might be um, might be ideal, we, as I read it, if you jump to your section 17.06, which is special requirements for farmlands and forests, just how much of our farmland and forest our core habitat and critical natural landscapes on the Massachusetts GIS Biomap 3, or land designated as priority habitat or estimated habitat as defined. Well, that's hard by the defined by the Massachusetts Endangered Species Act, because we don't even know what areas have endangered species on them until we actually try to build something on them and somebody finds a box turtle. But and I don't mean to be facetious. But um, it, it's, it's, if we can find a way to restrict solar development to poor habitat and critical natural landscapes, I, mean, I guess if we, can, if we can find a way to restrict it on a defined, on a defined area that is mapped, that is so much more helpful to me in having clarity in what we can build or not build on. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's- That, that makes total sense, Don, both of your points. Um, starting with the second one, here's, I think you can see section 1706. I'm beginning to appreciate more that the bylaw is really focused on restricting so, uh, solar development on those most sort of special lands, the prime farmland that's defined with prime soils and those forests that fall under those particular biomap um, characterizations. Um, so I think that they are doing a good job of trying to limit the restrictions on solar to those areas that are sort of pretty well defined through the state mapping efforts uh, as, as you know, sort of valuable ecosystems and valuable, the most valuable farming. Um, for your first point, I totally agree with that. And I would encourage anybody who has some ideas for going way back up to the beginning under the purpose, um, that, that first sentence, I, I like it better than what it had been, but it does seem to suggest that, you know, there's, there's solar and then there's the public health benefits of forests. Well, as Don just said, there's huge public health benefits of solar. Um, you know, thousands of people die in Massachusetts due to air pollution caused by burning fossil fuels. Um, I, there's a study that even breaks it down by town, and it turns out to be one or two people per year have a pre are, are killed prematurely because of fossil fuel pollution. Um, nobody's dying because of ground mount solar installations. Um, so if there's any, any ideas that you guys have about how this wording could be changed a little bit to indicate that solar has a health, um, public health, welfare, safety benefit. Um, I think that could be something ECAC could 
recommend to tweak the language here because as Stephanie mentioned, this is still malleable. They've reviewed it once. They're going to come back. They'll probably come back several times to tweak this purpose. So I encourage any suggestions to come back to us from you guys. I, I still just, uh, and maybe because I don't understand it, but you know how large an area the core habitat and critical natural yeah. landscapes are. But it, if that's a large enough area, why do we need to, I mean, why shouldn't the nexus statement simply be, you know, we want to promote blah, 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 because in, in areas of core habitat and critical natural landscapes and priority habitat are estimated, then, then you've, you've, you've basically said these, we all agree, promote, preserving these promote the health, safety, and welfare of the community. Pre preserving any forest that sequesters or may sequester doesn't quite rise to the level of that. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a whole different feeling, but as I read the nexus statement, it's like, you know, gosh, if it's a forest and it's because it's so important to preserve mm -hmm. carbon sequestration, I, I just don't I don't like the balancing at all. It just doesn't sound to me like it's a true balancing test. That's all. OK, great. I get that. Yeah, I, I this is something I want to confirm. But, yeah, I think the language, the details later in the, the bylaw is restricting developments on prime agricultural soil and those special habitats that are mapped out to the biomap effort. But that's not what is indicated in these, the purpose and the nexus statements. You're right. They sort of like all forests need to be saved and protected. Yeah. So that that's a great um, yeah. tweak we can think about. Caitlin. Yeah, I was just thinking like definitely to the balancing act um, comments, if there was like maybe the language could be changed to like focusing efforts um, or just more, yeah, I maybe something to be more about like intentional efforts or focusing efforts instead of having to do with a balancing act. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I like that. Um, if you can think of possibly you know, even specific ways of tweaking the language, that would be really helpful. Let me write that this to share to send along and share share with us. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how to proceed here if if this is a bit of a moving target. Um, you know, I was thinking if if things hadn't changed much, Steve, I was going to say, why don't we put some of the stuff that you wrote into a letter for ECAC to send to the CRC? Um, is that does that still make sense given that it's a moving target? Are there, are there some things we should say? Do you want to take his first stab at a at a draft uh, a draft letter, or what do you think? Because I think I think. We're, I think we're all talking about the same thing here. I don't think I don't feel like there's a lot of disagreement on on these points. I could be wrong, but I didn't hear everyone sort of sort of talking along the same lines. Yeah. So it might make sense to put together some sort of a letter for ECAP to send to the CRC. I could do that. I think my understanding that CRC has <clears throat> made these revisions to the purpose and the nexus. They last night they, they had their meeting last night the most recent meeting last night they mm -hmm. they put these aside they moved on they went through in excruciating detail <laughs> the definitions section that follows this and that was a, a wonderful um, example of uh, sausage making you know getting really into the nitty gritty details and I was really impressed that the counselors were really considering the details and the importance of those definitions in there. I believe they're going to move on to the section after the definitions, um, some of the submittal requirements, and then I believe they're going to come back and sort of reassess the purpose. So, yes, if we were to, from ECAC, sort of send some suggestions for framing the purpose of Nexus, I think that would be timely. It'd be appropriate because they'll be coming back to that after they finish all the other gory details. 
So do you want to put something together or are we ready to do it right now or? I guess I'm not ready to do it right now. Uh, I can put something together and um, for the next meeting. One of the challenges, they meet Tuesdays and then we meet the immediate Wednesday, the next day. So there could be significant developments the day before we have our public, have our ECAC meeting um, as has happened this time. Um, okay, but yeah, I could put something together suggesting some ways to reframe, I guess, the purpose, the nexus, and then maybe... If we can, if we still have some time to talk about some of the elements of the of the um, further down in the bylaw, um, I can begin to draft something. We can sh probably have a meeting or two where we can talk about that that statement and then revise it and then send it on as an ECAC recommendation. CRC will finish this and then it will go to town council, and I suspect it'll get a lot of discussion and probably more public discussion at town council than it has experienced um, in the CRC meeting. So it's, it's kind of a long path to go before this actually comes to a vote. Yeah. Caitlin, did you have another question? Your hand's still up. <laughs> no, sorry. I forgot to lower it. All right. <laughs> it's okay. So yeah, I, I suspect we probably need to move on on our agenda. And yep. I so yes, I will try to make some kind of a, a, a draft and I appreciate any sort of ideas and input beyond what you've said tonight. Yeah, You can send those to Lori and Stephanie and then they'll forward them to me um, for ideas. And then um, if anybody has experience with specific aspects of bylaws and regulations and you want to get into it, get deeper into the submittal requirements, um, other aspects of it, I would that would be great. Um, mm -hmm. The one thing I did, as, as uh, Don pointed out, it's like, what is what is the impact of restricting solar developments off of those categories of biomap? lands that they refer to and i'm not sure i can find a section here i'm just kind of scrolling mm -hmm. um i would say one of my suggestions one of my thoughts is to recommend that an analysis get done of sort of how much land that might currently be available for solar development would be restricted from solar development if this bylaw passes um, and that may be categorized under the farmland provisions as well as under the forest provisions I think that would really be useful to know. Is it potentially only restricting 10% of Amherst lands or is it restric restricting 90% of Amherst lands from solar development? Yeah. Um, I think that would be really useful in, in the conversation to sort of help decide whether these restrictions are, are reasonable and still allow for the amount of solar development that we know we need, or are they restricting solar to you know less than two percent of the town lands, which we know the courts have already said that's not sufficient? Don. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have one more. I mean, I think Stephen, I'm I'm happy to communicate separately. But as I look at this, you know, with a with an eye like a lawyer, um, because you're a lawyer, you know, um. <laughs> things get challenged in court and bylaws get tied up for a long period of time. Um, Shootsbury's is still tied up. <laughs> um, to the extent that we can make this less subjective um, and more objective, um, because you can't have a bylaw like this that picks out, you know, you know, this zoning, um, uh, this map zoning map area can have them this one can't have them but what you can do with this nexus assuming these these protected lands are s significant enough so that we're what you can do is have something that is very objective if if it's if it's on this map as a protected habitat you can't put solar ground large ground mounted solar on it if it's not on this, you can sort of thing. Um, it, it just getting rid of the subjectivity takes the court out of a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to say that um, last night's meeting, um, they were discussing a draft which town staff had made comments on. 
And I believe, I understand Stephanie was sort of helping to bring all those comments together. And one of the things that sounded to me like the town staff were saying was exactly that, make it definable, make it objective and make it clear and consistent. And so town staff had flagged provisions in here that were sort of more on the subjective side or not sufficiently defined. Um, so I think they're doing a good job at raising those those areas that could be fuzzy or could open the bylaw to to legal challenges. I think you know, another, sort of a backdrop to this bigger background state Massachusetts is considering um, changing the way that renewable energy infrastructure is permitted um, and the, the, the law that didn't pass over the summer or the proposed changes to the law that did not pass over the summer had some fairly substantial changes to way that solar uh, or that renewable energy infrastructure that would include solar, that would include some kinds of power lines, batteries, other things um, could be reviewed and permitted. And it would in many ways sort of take some of the control away from the towns and have a more streamlined process in part to speed up the development. That did not pass. There's some movement by the governor to try to bring that back to the forefront. It may or may not work in the near future. It may be that it has to wait for the legislative cycles that will take a year or two. But it could be that this bylaw in two years basically gets wiped out because the state has passed new laws about that permitting process. Um, that's interesting. I'm not sure that that influences how the town wants to develop a bylaw, um, but it may be that the thing, the, the state background or the state law, which supersedes town and city laws, um, may change in the, in the future. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. Really appreciate all the work you put into this. Um, should we move on? Okay, if there are no objections, I will go on to the next agenda item, which I think is the waste issues, right? And I still haven't looked into the recycling thing, but I do have with me, I went to a District 2 meeting uh, with uh, Lynn Griesemer. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I always get that wrong. Um, she's my, one of our reps, and Pat DeAngelis, I think, was also there, uh, talking about the waste hauler pro proposal that has, um, that, 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 um, recently went through town council. And so I have her slides and I figured I'd just go through them. I think it's pretty straightforward. I will share this. Um, <clears throat> remembering that zero waste is a goal of the CARP. Um, this was a nice reminder of what we currently use. Can you all see that? Did I, it says waste hauler present program and proposed changes. Yep. Good, okay. So, um, uh, Lynn pointed out that Amherst is a regional leader in environmentally conscious waste management practices, or has been. There's been a food-related styrofoam ban. Uh, there's a solid waste master plan that you can look at. Um, plastic bag ban a few years ago. And there's the CARP. Um, the current system... Um, So the, the question was, can we do better than what our current system is? Um, and I don't know, does she actually talk about the current system? If she doesn't, I thought she did, uh, maybe a little bit here. So, so I can say as a, as a resident, I think most of you know this, right? We, we have the choice of either being able to pay, I think it's 125 bucks a year, plus a cost for every bag we bring in uh, or every item we bring in to the, to the transfer station. We can haul our own waste or we can contract with USA Recycling um, which is pretty much the only game in town. And that happened a few years ago when a host of local, um, local waste haulers were all bought by USA and uh, they immediately doubled the price of our waste hauling. And it got, if anything, worse. They don't take, it's much more expensive to take anything other than just the two baskets they provide you with, the two large baskets they provide you with. And um, they don't, they, apparently they do do compost, if you pay extra, they will pick up compostables, which I was unaware of. Um, so it's not a great system. You can 
you can make everything work. You can, you know, do your compostable separate from your trash and greatly reduce the amount of trash, but it costs quite a lot. And um, so the question is, can we do better? What, how can we do better? And could we do better with a municipal contract for a waste hauler instead of going through USA Recycle, which is an enormous uh, company that I think does all of Connecticut and uh, down to the New York area, maybe too. They're, they're huge. Um, so the main, the main point to realize is that something like, what is it, 30% of municipal waste is organic material that could be composted. Um, compost thrown into landfills generates methane, which is bad. Uh, if it's composted properly, it becomes fertilizer so, or, or soil. So taking care of that is a big part of getting to zero waste and getting to a better system. So the idea is to reduce our reliance on landfills and incinerators, to reduce greenhouse gas emission, to potentially reduce hauling and disposal costs, to increase transparency and public control over waste practices in town. Lynn seemed pretty sure that she knew what USA Recycling was doing with our waste, but I, I was impressed by how sure she was of that. Um, <laughs> Because to me, it's a big black box, and you know, I, I don't really know where my plastics go or how many of them are actually getting recycled, for example. Um, but I gather that USA has a good reputation um, from, I, I don't know that firsthand. Uh, uh, but the idea is to have something that's more locally controlled, that we really know what's going on, and a way to incentivize people to recycle and compost organics through a more robust fee structure. Uh, there were requests from the audience to, there was one person in particular, a neighbor of mine, who was already sort of concerned about our fee structure. She, for example, you can, I, I can take my trash to Northampton and I think it cost me like five bucks or something like that. <laughs> but in order to get a sticker for Amherst, I have to pay 125 bucks even to get in the door. And that is an unusual system that does, keeps a lot of people from using the transfer station directly. Um, especially, you know, uh, individuals who may live alone and have very little waste, they do their own composting, um, you know, to have to pay 125 bucks to get rid of a bag of trash every, every month is a little bit crazy. Um, so there were requests about fixing that as well. That wasn't part of the RFP, I think. Um, so the three key elements of the proposed revision were that it be a town contracted system. It's a robust pay as you throw fee structure and it has to include curbside composting. Um, oh, here, she does talk about the current system. I thought this was in here somewhere. Uh, okay, you contract your own right now, you contract with your, on your own with a private hauler, which is pretty much only USA Recycle. Um, they're licensed by the town's health department. They're the primary provider, and they do weekly pickups of trash and bi-weekly pickup of recyclables. And this I had not known about, this weekly curbside composting. Uh, they will do that as well for extra fee. Um, at the transfer station, you can dispose of almost anything for $125 a year plus a payment for the thing you're getting rid of. So there's household trash, which you have to buy bags for, big plastic bags that you put your trash in, you pay per bag. Uh, there's food waste composting, which is free after you pay $125. Um, electronics, many bulk waste items, batteries, mercury, scrap metals, yard waste. If you do any construction on your home, you can get rid of all that stuff there. Um, and there is a town-wide leaf collection on occasion and occasional hazardous waste collection as well. <coughs> so the motion that went forward was this one, that the town would negotiate a contract with a waste hauler or haulers on behalf of resi resi the residents for the collection of household trash unlimited recyclables and compostables. The contract would include a robust pay as you throw fee structure. So people who have less waste pay less. Um, curbside composting would be available to all residents. Uh, the transfer station would remain open, but its role in the waste management program has yet to be determined. So they'd be rethinking how the transfer station works. Program would be phased in beginning with single family, two and three, two, three and four unit properties and expanding to all residential properties within three years. Haulers must provide an annual report to the town on the weight in tons of trash, recyclables, and compostables collected. And there would be an advantage in awarding the contract to haulers who dispose of compost locally rather than transporting it somewhere and making more greenhouse gas by doing that. So that was the motion that I believe passed. Um, 
So here are they were so they, they called this meeting in part to ask for our input, you know, so what will be the what they need to, and what they need to know from the, you know, what they need to know from this RFP is what is the cost going to be to all of us and to the town? Um, how is the pay as you throw fee system going to be structured? How will enforcement be handled? Who will handle complaints and customer service? What additional services might be available, such as bulk pickup or yard waste? Will there be exemptions? And if so, what would they be? Um, so they were sort of looking for, I, I think, I think these are things that will be to some extent answered in the RFP and to some extent they were asking for what, what we all as members of the town wanted. So, and they were asking also for help getting input from the community. Um, you know, how to phase in large, larger residential complexes. I'm not quite sure I understand why that is a problem. Oh, because of the pay as you throw fee structure. You can't just throw your stuff into a big old dumpster if it's pay as you throw, right? <laughs> okay, how to make curbside composting available to all residences. Should the bylaw include small businesses? If there's a bylaw, bylaw. I guess there's gonna be a bylaw around this as well. Uh, what will the role of the transfer station be under the new system? And how can the town lead by example and become a model for what we're asking of residents? So those are the sorts of things you're still looking at. I'm not sure what, how the bylaw comes into this. Does anybody know? Stephanie, do you understand that? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I um, don't have yeah. a response to that. Yeah, I don't remember where that came into this because this was all about an RFP. Oh, here we go, because there is a current bylaw. <laughs> um, so the Board of Health shall promulgate regulations establishing conditions for the provision of refuse collection, service, and separation of recyclable materials. Okay. All commercial haulers collecting or removing municipal solid waste accumulating within the town or using the streets and roads of the town for the purpose of collecting or transporting the same shall be licensed. All licenses granted uh, to private haulers, okay, and contracts of other forms of authorization are duly authorized. So it looks like this is talking about private haulers and the change would be to a more, to a publicly contracted hauler. So that might be why this might need a new bylaw. I'm guessing here, I don't remember how this came into play. I don't remember her discussing this actually. Actually, I think these kind of bylaws were originally put in place so, so people didn't just dump their trash in the backyard, um, which ha happened, you know, centuries ago, or not even that far ago as centuries ago. The, the town put a bylaw in that said you, you can't, essentially, you can't do that, um, and you know that that's what really led to these kind of bylaws i think so okay. so except except now we're all being encouraged to to compost and put our trash in the backyard <laughs> but at any rate <laughs> so so i think that's you know that was pretty much what what was discussed and i think this all i mean anything that improves the situation for greenhouse gases it seems to me is something we want to support and uh, if we could get I, there are two important things about this, I think, um, that have worked really well in other towns I'm aware of. I, I'm thinking of Ithaca, New York, um, where they've, they've for decades now, <laughs> decades had, had uh, you know, household composting in a pay-as-you-throw fee structure um, that really keeps people from making waste. I mean, I remember being amazed at some of my friends who lived there, how little waste they produce. It makes me embarrassed. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, it, it's, there's a real, there's a real, yeah, if someone told me I'm going to get paid for every bag of, of trash I throw out, I, I would be a lot more careful about what I throw out, right? And if I could separate out all the food waste, I do a lot of cooking. A lot of my waste is food. I compost some of it, but I don't usually have the time to compost all of it. I just don't have the energy to do it. Um, so it would be great to have, you know, this, this would get everybody to be able to do this more easily, right? Um, so is there any discussion or questions or anything we're thinking about how to, <laughs> I'll stop sharing. Um, 
Andrew has his hand up. Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, um, I just, for the focus on, on like apartment buildings and how do you do pay as you throw for apartment buildings, I thought pay as you throw was you buy the bags and that's, you, you have to use specific bags and then you fill those bags and that's your payment, however many bags you use. So why couldn't apartment buildings be like, buy your own bags, the only thing allowed in dumpsters are those bags. I, I don't quite understand the issue. That might work. That might okay. work. Yeah. I, I don't think Great. that's how it works in some other places. And in some other places, you you they do it by weight, I think. Um, uh -huh. I think it was people were using shopping bags. They weren't using, uh, it's sort of it's sort of noxious that you have to use a, a pre-provided heavy plastic bag that's going to degrade into microplastics <laughs> to throw away sure. the trash. Um, but maybe that's maybe that's the best way to do it, or maybe a paper bag, you know, a big paper sack or something. I don't know. That, that, that does make sense. Yeah, if you're buying your bags, then it makes sense. If you're if you're throwing away smaller you know units and paying by weight, uh, maybe not. Mm -hmm. I I do that. I buy the the paper throw bags and then I take my stuff straight to the transfer station and toss it in the dumpster. They're not heavy duty bags. Yeah. Oh, they're not. Um, Are they paper yeah. or plastic? I thought they they're were pla plastic. they're plastic. They're large plastic bags, and I I I can fit. Yeah, we don't have a lot of trash from here, but if it's heavy or sharp, those bags can split. And more than once when I've gone to hoist that thing up into the, over the little railing and into the dumpster, stuff is split out and falls apart. Um, I, I, I suspect that rental property owners like apartments might be worried that, you know, how do they control who's putting stuff into the dumpster? Um, and yeah, the good tenants will put it in a pay th per throw bag, but who's, you know, who's to stop somebody from just throwing their trash straight into the dumpster. And so landlords and managers are, are faced with that challenge of kind of policing that effort, which is you know, yeah. something that they're not keen on doing in many cases. Right, right. Hmm. What, what's this? Oh, Who was promoting sorry. this trash and recycling bylaw? Was there a, a, a waste working group or a citizens group that was promoting it? Yeah, I think, I think Darcy and probably, I'm guessing Mothers Out Front, if Darcy was involved. Um, I haven't heard it discussed at Local Energy Advocates, so I'm betting it's Mothers Out Front. Uh, I don't know, though, for sure. Stephanie, do you? Sorry, there was a um, zero waste effort. And there were a group of people that were involved in, involved in that. And I think it's some of the folks from that. Uh, Darcy is very uh, key and central to the effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess, you know, I think I think this is something that, that ECAC probably should um, help with if we can. And including it, the way I was figuring on doing it right away is just including it as including at least getting this RF. Um, I think the RFP is, has gone out, but following up on the RFP as part of the uh, goals for the uh, town um, manager next year, right? So that was, how do we say it? I think I closed it already, but it was in there as a single sentence saying, support this effort, <laughs> essentially. So is that, as long as that's okay with everyone, seems, okay, seems all right to leave that in. That was the one. I can I can find that again. Yeah, no, I yeah, I agree. I think that seems reasonable to include that in our goals. I guess I would kind of propose the question to us, what specific items does ECAC actions or involvement do we have in pushing this forward, promoting it? Um yeah, I I, I guess I other, other than kind of, you know, keeping up to date in the news about it? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, it, it's gone through the council. It's not clear what we could do at this point. They do want input on how these things could work. Maybe I could get some more information from Lynn about what sort of input the council wants. Is it the problem of how, you know, I'm, I'm curious as to how she sees the issues of multifamily of apartment complexes. You know, maybe we can have some input on that. How do other towns do it? I don't know. Stephanie, you have a question? Um, uh, just a suggestion that if you 
um, you could, you know, weigh in as a committee and submit a letter of support. I don't know if you just said that, but I think a letter of support from the committee, you know, would hold some weight. All right, and I can draft that for next time if you want. I've done that sort of thing before. Um, why don't I just do that and then we can decide, you know, wordsmith it next time and decide to send it. Who This would be to the council? Okay. Okay, so please, um, who's taking notes? Michael, just make sure that, that I'm not taking notes myself today because I've got too many things on the agenda to keep track of. So make sure that somewhere in there it says that Goldberg promised to draft a letter for next time. <laughs> discussion next time or on the next meeting agenda item yeah <laughs> and please send me a draft copy of that sometime before the day before the next meeting <laughs> <laughs> so that's time to do that um yeah send, send me the draft minutes as soon as you have them i will thanks um all right so any other discussion on that or shall we move on I think I think Michael probably has to go about now, if I remember right. Uh, yes, I I do. I'm just gonna finish up some of these notes, but right. and um, Stephanie, Stephanie will keep continue keeping notes for us. Okay, good. In that case, let's continue down the list. I don't have anything about the recycling ban request, so we'll keep that on the agenda for next time. Um, uh, education and outreach. Pace, Don, anything? No, I have no, I have nothing. I mean. You know, we're still talking about kind of coordinating that with the um, with the heat pump program, but we'll right. see. Yep. Yep. And likewise, I don't have anything for heat pumps and Tony's not here. I don't have anything for climate resilient schools. So going down the list, unless unless anyone has anything on any of those education and outreach points. OK, advisory and support. Um, we talked about that. We did the, bio, the so the oh, no, sorry. This is the rental building efficiency bylaw. Anything else there to talk about, Steve? No, nothing new on that front. Okay, and you also did more than your <laughs> job this week by giving us all that solar bylaw information. Tony's not here. Uh, regional and state policy updates. I am drawing a blank. I have been watching a number of issues, but I can't think of them right now and didn't make notes. So I will skip that for this week. Um, dang, just it's just out of my head. All right, staff updates, Stephanie? Don't really have anything new since the last meeting. Okay. Uh, ECAC member updates. Anyone have updates? Okay. Uh, I know so the next agenda. Anything we should include in the next agenda? Other than what we've already discussed, a couple of important things. Okay. What was the what was the main takeaway from our solar bylaw discussion? Is that I think <laughs> there are, there's a lot of things said. So I just wanted like, are there was, was there a concrete takeaway of the next step for us? I think Steve said he might or uh, try to summarize our ideas and comments. <laughs> um, Michael, you were going to write a draft statement for ECAC <laughs> to review. <laughs> no, I think I think that was my uh, my next step will be to try to write a statement that um, to spur a little bit more discussion within ECAC that would then become some recommendations that we would forward to CRC for ways to tune up, particularly that intro and nexus statement, um, and then perhaps make some suggestions. This is at least my thinking suggestions for to be mindful of or to do an analysis of how much land would be removed from the possible solar development based on the restrictions in the bylaw. Right. That, that's what I'm thinking. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to do that in the next week it, or two weeks before our next meeting. I'm not sure if I'll get that done, but I'll give it a try. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Okay, and now if there's nothing else, we're at public comments, but there's no okay. public. I'm gonna drop off now. Okay, take care, Michael. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> bye, so, bye. Bye. And um, if there's nothing else, I think we can adjourn. Do we have a move to adjourn? Move. So moved by Steve. Second. Don. All right. In that case, I'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, all. Bye-bye.
Bye. Bye. Bye.